this opportunity came up and I'm like, yeah, this would be a great idea. Of course, come in and take 50% of the business I had already created. No big deal. This is amazing. I can't do this on my own. This is getting scary and big. Talk about fear of success. This is what it looks like taking on a partner when you almost hit a million dollars in your business. It's wildly weird to even say I did that, but I did it. <laughs> and what happened was the years that followed, I started to act as though he was my boss. Well, hello there and welcome to this episode of The Terry Cole Show. I want to start with a question. Have you ever thought about leaving your nine to five job? Have you ever thought that you would really like to be your own boss? Maybe you don't know where to start, but has it ever entered your mind that you'd like to make your own schedule? That you would like to be location independent in a real way? That you would like to be the boss? Well, if any of this is resonating with you, then you are in luck because I'm interviewing my good friend, Amy Porterfield, who just wrote a book called Two Weeks Notice, Find the Courage to Quit Your Job, Make More Money, Work Where You Want, and Change the World. And we talk about all of the things because we both actually have taken this journey. And I love so much that Amy has written this incredibly accessible step-by-step process of a book which you guys can get anywhere right now the pre-sales are happening so you can go to amazon or go to her website amyporterfield.com or anywhere you buy books you're independent booksellers you can put in an order anywhere this is a book that i feel like has been needed for so long and i have to say personally amy was a real champion for my early online business where i really was afraid of marketing i didn't know what I was doing and she was so incredibly generous we ended up meeting through mutual friends many years ago went on a crazy vacation together like we had spent time together but then when I really needed help expanding my business and sort of breaking into marketing my courses online and learning how to do it and doing webinars Amy was right there her strategies were right there I took courses with her and it was incredibly helpful because I was really anti-marketing and I was really scared to do it. So for you, if this is something that is interesting to you, Amy is such an unbelievable guide. She's an ex-corporate girl, she says, so to speak, gal, turned online marketing expert. And she's the CEO of a multi-million dollar business. And during her corporate days, she worked with mega brands like Harley Davidson, as well as Tony Robbins. Working for Tony was her last sort of nine to five job before she ended up going out on her own. And so what she's learned over the many years that she's been doing this is what you will learn in this interview. So I hope that you enjoy listening to this interview with me and Amy Porterfield as much as I enjoyed doing it. I'm so incredibly excited to welcome my pal, Amy Porterfield, to the Terry Cole Show. Hi, Amy. Oh my goodness, I've been looking forward to this all day. How are you, my friend? I am so good, but better question is, how are you? Well, I am good, I am good. We were, I have to be honest though, we were talking off camera. I have lots of emotions going through my body right now, getting ready to launch a big book, but I'm here for it. Yeah. Part of what we were talking about, and I want to get into, I've got all my questions. We're going to talk about the book. It's amazing. I, I have to say, and I said this in the upfront to my people, that you're the perfect person to write this book. And that years ago, you're between you and Marie Forleo. This is how I learned how to have an online business. But you taught me about marketing and webinars and messaging in a way that was so, it made it doable because as a psychotherapist, and I was like young to this online world, like all the people who are gonna be buying your book who are buying your book right now, where it just seemed so incredibly overwhelming. And you're like, but it's not. And what I love about the book is that it's written in the same incredibly accessible way that you taught me all of those years ago, literally, like step one, Love. like you, you, you can't yes. do it wrong if you're willing to be coached. And that, that's what I really feel about this book is that it's for people who are like, I feel overwhelmed. I know I need to get out of what I'm doing. I know I have something else to offer. I want more freedom. How do I do it? Trust me, two weeks notice, this is for you people. 
anyway, I just wanted to start off saying that because one, I, when you told me that you were, you know, doing a book, I was like, oh my God, thank God, because this is the book that people really do need, according to me, if this is what you want to do. But I want to know about you. (laughs) Why, why now for the book and why, why this book? You know, I have wanted to write a book for a long time. Actually, let me take that back. I feel like I should write a book. Like for many years, I feel like, oh, I should be writing a book. Everyone tells you, you got to get a book out there. If you've been around for a while, you got to write a book. And I just never felt totally compelled to do so. So I would talk about it, but never really do it. And then about two years ago, I thought, I can make this easier for people. And I I looked at my track record and my journey and I thought, oh, wow, I made a lot of mistakes. There were a lot of tears. There was so much confusion and overwhelm and it didn't have to be that way. So I essentially wrote the book that I wish I had 14 years ago when I left my very last nine to five job. So someone could say, here, this is exactly how you get started in terms of mindset and actual strategy and tactics. And so I decided it's time now. I have a proven track record. I've helped enough students. I know what it takes. Let's go. And so that's why I did it. I love it. So tell us a little bit about your backstory in being a corporate gal who turned into this extremely successful (laughs) online entrepreneur. Tell us. Well, let me just first tell you, I was a really good corporate girl. Like I was good in a nine to five job. I, in the book, I call myself a corporate yes girl back in the day. And it was very true, but I loved the security of a paycheck every other week. I liked having that health insurance. I liked being told what to do. And then I would do it even better and get the rewards, the accolades, the add girls. Like I liked the structure. I liked working with the team, like so much about working in a nine to five job, it worked for me. And so I did it since the day I left college. And my last corporate job was with Tony Robbins for almost seven years. And it was a dream job. I got to travel the world with Tony, work on the content that he does on stage, Unleash the Power Within, Date with Destiny. If you know Tony, you know those events. And all of that was amazing. But in the book, in the very beginning, I tell this story that Tony had a meeting with internet marketing owners. They all own their own business. They all were entrepreneurs. They had digital courses and memberships and masterminds and products and all of that. And they all came into the office one day, sat around this big oak table. I was called in to take notes. That's how humbling it was. I wasn't even at the main table. I sat at a side table and I took notes. And those guys, they were all men. They started talking about their businesses, but all I heard was freedom. And I know you talk about this a lot in your book and in your, on your podcast, this idea of designing a life on your own terms, having the freedom to call the shots. And that's all I wanted in that moment. But before that, I had never even thought about being a business owner or an entrepreneur. So if someone's listening now and they're like, that's not ever even been in my thoughts. Like I could Mm -hmm. never do that. That's exactly where I was at the time. But there was this knowing, this yearning in me that I no longer wanted to be a boss. In that moment when these guys were talking about their businesses, I didn't understand what they were doing. Like I didn't know webinars and funnels and all that stuff back then. But I did know I didn't want to be told what to do, when to do it, or how to do it anymore. I didn't want to be on someone else's time or someone else's dime. At that moment, I was done. A switch had flipped. And so that's kind of what started me on this journey. It's not like I left the next day. It was a year later Mm -hmm. that I actually went out on my own. But that's kind of where it came from. But I like to tell that story to say, like, I wasn't an entrepreneur when I came out of the womb. You know how some people just always have had that entrepreneurial spirit? That was absolutely not me. I totally identify with that because that was not me either. I was like the accidental entrepreneur, right? Where it was especially yeah, as a therapist, right. right? I was like terrified. And I, I remember when I was a talent agent back in the day, like in this corporate structure, exactly like you're talking about where, you know, paid vacations, all the things I would look out my window on East 22nd street in New York city. And I would see people walking with like a yoga mat at like 11 o'clock yeah. on a Tuesday. And I'd be like, who are these effing people? Like, what, where are you what, going? What are you doing? And what do you do for yeah. money? But there was something that was so felt so risky about taking that plunge. And the, the whole thing about understanding the world 
of online marketing, the, the demystification. And what I really love about in the way you've laid out the book is that the step-by-step -step process of assuming that people are starting from ground zero. So you help walk us through even trying to figure out like deeply, what, what is it that you want to do? What are you better at than other people? Like, so no matter where you are on your journey, I, I think it's important what you're saying, Aim, that you don't have to be quote unquote, a born entrepreneur right. to change the way that you're working. And how do yeah. you see the pandemic affecting people's desire to do this? Oh, that was huge. You know, I started writing this book during the pandemic, but it came out at such the perfect time, which is right after the pandemic, essentially, because what happened during the pandemic is that our ambition didn't change in the sense that we're still ambitious and we're still going after what we want, but what we want has absolutely changed. It's no longer all about the job. Before the pandemic, I would say most of us, we were being very honest, we were obsessed with our work, obsessed with our job, and that was a huge focus. But after the pandemic, when all of our priorities got totally shaken up, now it's like, yeah, but spending time with my family and my friends and myself and paying attention to my health and my hobbies and my downtime is equally important to me climbing the corporate ladder or building my business or whatever it might be. And so because our ambitions have changed, so has how we want to do work. And so working from home is not the only desire people have, but working for themselves so that they can call the shots. Because let's be honest, when you are in a nine to five job, if you're in a nine to five job and you are not happy with where you're at, I can promise you, you're likely underpaid, undervalued, overworked, and there's not much you can do about that when you are not your own boss. So I think the pandemic shone a light on what really matters to us, and it's not all all working for somebody else and making a paycheck. Indeed. All right. So in the book, you talk a little bit about the importance of unbossing, quote unquote. So tell yes. us a little bit about how to unboss. <laughs> we need to talk about this because this is, you know, we have a mutual friend, Gabby Bernstein, and mm -hmm. she actually came up with this word when we were starting to talk about the book. She's like, you should name it unbossing. I'm like, yeah, but we have to explain the word. So it's probably not a great word for the, <laughs> the title, but it has to be in the book. Here's where this idea came from. I grew up with a really strict dad. It was his way or the highway. He was my very first boss. And having a male boss, very young, it's all I knew. I go into the work world, all male bosses, it's all I knew. And so I always had a boss, someone telling me what to do, leading the way. I never had to lead the way myself. And so when I eventually went out on my own, I looked around and I'm like, wait a second, I I'm the boss. I'm telling myself what to do. And although I was competent enough to do so, I was very insecure about making decisions, the right decisions, knowing what to do and when to do it, thinking if I don't get this right, I'm gonna have to go grovel back for my nine to five job. So I put so much pressure on myself and I started to navigate in the online space as an entrepreneur and about three years in, I brought on a male business partner. And the reason for that is I was doing well. I had almost hit a million dollars in one year in my business three years in. So it yeah. was doing yeah. well, but I was scared to do it alone. And I was so used to having a boss, someone to lead the way that it was really quick. This opportunity came up and I'm like, yeah, this would be a great idea. Of course, come in and take 50% of the business I had already created. No big deal. This is amazing. I can't do this on my own. This is getting scary and big. Talk about fear of success. This is what it looks like taking on a partner when you almost hit a million dollars in your business. It's wildly weird to even say I did that, but I did it. Mm -hmm. And what mm -hmm. happened was the years that followed, I started to act as though he was my boss. Now, he was a great guy. He was incredibly successful. We made tons of money and impact together. Nothing sure. against him, but I didn't know how to be my own boss even three years in. So I would look to him when something went right. Is that good? When something didn't go right, what are we gonna do? Should I do this, should I do that? I took all the action items and I just fell back into having a boss. 
Mm. Now, fast forward to the disaster that created. I'll leave that for the readers of the book because I don't even want to rehash it. it. I might cry on camera. It was a really <laughs> rough time to get out of that. Yeah. But my point being is I had never learned to unboss until that moment when I realized I don't want a partner. I've gone back to my old ways and I left my old ways so I could lead the way. I wanted mm. to call the shots. And so the idea of unbossing is believing that you are capable of leading yourself without anyone else having to tell you what to do or how to do it, or having to always bounce ideas off someone because you're afraid that your ideas are not valid enough. Unbossing is standing on your own saying, I got this. And when it doesn't work out, I will figure it out. It took right. me many years to emboss myself, but that's where everything cracked wide open. It's so interesting though, Aim, the, the whole like going back to what's familiar, like reaching a certain level of success and feeling scared. When, when I talk about change and success and failure, that really, you know, fear of success and fear of failure are two sides of the same coin and that coin is fear of change. Mm. And it's like, right? Yes, absolutely. Because even up leveling your business right now, now you're talking about playing in the big leagues. Now you're talking about money beyond what you thought and all of that stuff. And suddenly it was like, this is too much for me until you realize, no, actually I'm the only one who can do it. And I, I wondered if, if I may ask you, cause I don't know this from the book for you, was there any therapeutic process that went along with the unboxing or, or this shift? Because usually from a therapeutic point of view, we can only talk it out or act it out. And it's like in that moment, there was an acting out of the unresolved stuff. Yes, so true. So when you say, a th I love this question, when you say a therapeutic process, like give me an example of what that might look like. Well, for, did you get into therapy? I mean, that, the first thing oh, is, did you actually have someone you were absolutely. talking to about it? Absolutely. Yes. Therapy was a very big piece of the puzzle during that time. And so here's what I did. One, I got a therapist and I had to talk it out and talk it out. Yeah. Two, I started going to acupuncture and mm. this woman also did Reiki. And that was really powerful for me as well, because there would be days I was so afraid I was going to lose my business because when I wanted out of the partnership, we couldn't come to an agreement. It was a whole year of just chaos. I and I was so that. afraid I was going to lose my business that I would cry all the time. I'd be on the table at acupuncture, like bawling my eyes out. I could not get it together, which is when I started going to therapy because I thought mm -hmm. I, I can't navigate like this. And I also had a few mentors that I reached out to people who had also gotten out of partnerships, had multi-million dollar businesses and could kind of share with me their experiences. So it was probably the first time in my entrepreneurial life that I said, I have to reach out to a lot of people in different ways because I literally can't figure this out on my own. And so to kind of get to the punchline, I, I got to a point that after about like a year of battling it out, how are we going to figure out, I needed to buy the business back, but we couldn't agree to a number and all of that. Mm -hmm. I went to bed one night and just crying still. I just couldn't get it together. And I woke up in the morning and I don't know if this is God, the universe, what it was, but all I felt was I will burn it down and build it back better. Yeah. Done. I will burn it down and build it back better. And when I agreed to doing that, knowing that I could start from scratch again, yeah. I had so much confidence and felt so grounded. Yeah. And the thing is, I didn't need to. We went to mediation after that. And I think my new mindset helped get me there. But so I was able to figure it out. But just saying that I would burn it down gave me so much confidence. But yeah. the reason I tell that story is there's some people listening right now that they don't realize that you have permission to start over. I don't care what age you are. You have permission to start over with zero social media following, zero people on your email list, zero dollars in your bank, quite honestly, and say, I'm not doing this anymore. I'm doing something dramatically different. Yep. And a lot of people won't do that because they'll think, what will other people think? I'm going to mm -hmm. tell people I'm going to leave my job and they're going to tell me I've lost my mind. During a recession, you don't do that. Well, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, you do. I left my job during the recession 14 years ago. It absolutely can happen. Oh, one more thing I want to add to that is when you decide 
to let's say burn it down and build it back better or leave your nine to five, whatever it is, be careful who you tell. I think this comes up with boundaries, like boundaries mm-hmm. around what you share. And when you tell people that can't hold that space for you, they will tell you all the reasons why you shouldn't do it. Sarah Blakely of Spanx said when she decided to cut the feet out of her pantyhose and create the first prototype of Spanx and and start that business, she didn't tell anyone because she said, I knew the first person that would tell me I was crazy, I would absolutely believe them. That's how vulnerable she was in the moment. So when you do decide to make this big change, only tell a few select people that absolutely deserve to know because they will support you no matter what. And that is such good advice. The whole be discerning. Because again, from a psychological point of view, you changing feels threatening to people. Yes, that's. thank you for saying that. I I couldn't put it into words. You changing is threatening to other people. And is it threatening to other people, I'm assuming, because they they too, they are like, "Uh, that's too scary. I couldn't do that. So why are you doing that? Is that where it comes from? There's, it's twofold from a psychological point of view. One is maybe you're, you're having the courage to do the thing they wish they had the courage to do. And maybe they're very unhappy in their day job and they would like to take the plunge. And so it's almost like they, they don't want you to do it because they're not doing it kind of, and they feel threatened. Like it shines a light on their own stagnation. Yes. Right. But then you have on the other side, people in our lives, like when we change, our partners, our siblings, our best friends, if they may feel threatened by that too, in that, are are you gonna change so much that you no longer will want or love me? Will I Mm. somehow not be a part of the new Amy? Maybe I'm gonna be left in the past. And again, so much of this is unconscious, right? People who love us, most of them are not gonna consciously think that, but this is where like the self-sabotaging advice can come in where people are like well i think you should take the safe route and i think that you should you should get to retirement age and then do that thing or whatever like you i'm sure you you heard all the things from all the people oh yeah for sure so discernment that's a perfect word and i think it's essential when you're following your dreams agreed And, and to it's the same way with any kind of vulnerability where People need to, we need evidence that folks are emotionally trustworthy, right? And we have to have boundaries enough to say, oh, hey, I'm really excited about this and I'm not seeking input right now. Oh, that is good. Right, right? Yes, I love that. Where were you when I was writing this book? I should have included that. (laughs) I love that. I'm excited about this and I'm not taking input right now. Yeah. Amen. Like Complete it's sense. already it's already decided though. That's the whole thing when people are like, are you sure? And did you think of this? And did you think of that? Like so much of the time when people are projecting their fearful shit onto me, it's so frustrating where I'll just be like, hello? Like you think I didn't think of those things? Right. Because here's the, the people that you went to, you were talking about when you were stuck in the, in the middle of this very difficult situation. You were discerning with who you went to, whose opinion you needed, whose expertise. You're like, this person has something that I believe is going to help me. We didn't go to like grandma. Like we didn't go to like parents, right? We, We didn't do that because we know they don't know anything about what we're doing. And this, I feel this way about so many people when it comes to my business. If I'm talking about it and someone's like, did you think about this? I will easily, no problem, say, oh, yeah, yeah. No, I I got it covered. Don't worry. Oh, smart. Right? I got it covered. Yeah, I got it covered. Stop giving me your unasked for advice because I don't want it. Oh, my gosh. So true. And part of the unbossing is, again, believing that you can figure it out. So that is so powerful just in it of itself. What I think yeah. that the book does though aim so beautifully is that it it's so accessible for folks wanting to make this change. This is a particular group of people in the world and it's bigger and bigger and bigger probably than it's ever been before this group. But it's like, if you're listening, if you're watching this, 
you can, the book is available right now for pre-sale. You can go get it, amazon.com. You can get it. Where else can they get it in? You can get it anywhere. Barnes and Noble, Target, it's everywhere. It's in all the places. You are not alone. And part of it is the, the, the dream that you have. Remember what Amy said at the, the top of this, right? She was like, I wasn't born an entrepreneur. And P.S., neither was I. So if you're unhappy with what you're doing, this is an invitation. Get the book, right? Read it. See if it speaks to you, if this is an inquiry, because there could be a lot of reasons that you're unhappy in your business, but perhaps you really are an entrepreneur. Maybe you really do need to unboss yourself. Maybe you really do need to step it up because here's the thing about regrets. I feel like I had so much fear in the beginning of my unbossing myself that there were so many times, and I did, I did go back to being a talent agent after I was not a talent agent anymore. I became a psychotherapist. And then, you know, it's one of those businesses where they're always like, they could just suck you back with all the money in the world, right? They're like, yes. here's, <laughs> here's a boat of cash. Would you like to come back? It's only for a brief <laughs> period of time, you know? And then you know, a year later, I was like, no, I have to get out of this business. Like, I have to stay out of this business. I'm a psychotherapist. What am I doing? But if you feel that way, there's a reason that you feel that way and that your fear is not a fact. Like, it doesn't mean abort the mission. It doesn't mean you can't do this. It's normal okay. to be afraid, right? Absolutely. The day I left my very last nine to five job, the one with Tony, I was driving out of the parking lot terrified, thinking, what did I just do? I didn't have a big nest egg of money. I didn't have a bunch of clients to work with. Like the next day, I wasn't going to be like rolling in clients and starting to make tons of money in my own business. And I had every fear and doubt in me. And one of the things that I went back to again and again was my why. Like that is something I talk about a lot in the book is why do you even want to do this? Now in the beginning, it was really selfish in, in, in a good way for me. I didn't want a boss. I wanted to call the shots. I wanted more lifestyle freedom, more than anything. And I let my why kind of pick me up when my fears literally flattened mm. me down. Like my fears could have kept me from never ever leaving that last nine to five job. But I kept coming back to what do I really want? You know, I was talking to a life coach on another podcast and she said, look, worst case scenario, you could go back to your nine to five job. Now I never said that and I don't say that in the book because in my mind I'm like, I don't even want to put that into people's heads. But she does make a point that this is not the end all be all. And the minute you drive out of that parking lot of your last nine to five job, it doesn't mean that you never have any other options if your plan doesn't work out. So we, we don't need to actually make it as big as I made it on that day. Right. But at the same time, just getting clear on what you want is going to be your North Star. Yes. And it's the thing that drives you because part of what I noticed started happening in my own life when I started doing more, when I was unbossing and then starting to do the online world is that I, I was so driven. I was so excited. I was so lit up. I was so inspired in a way that I had not been in my last, it was, it was not nine to five because it was more like eight to eight, but yeah, in entertainment, it seemed like that <laughs> shit never ended, but you know what I mean? Yes. So, so you're, I think that what people have to realize is that you realize, quote unquote, what you're giving up, but you have to have faith that there's, on the other side of this fear, is, is how you want to feel is, is the, you know, you talk in the book about the contribution, like the unique contribution that you have to give to the world. So if people are listening and they're like, okay, I want to do this. What is really the first step? So I love this question because in the book, I lay out this runway of from the day you decide I actually do want to be my own boss and start my own business from the moment you actually make it happen. That could be three months, six months, a year from now. For me, it was a full year that it took me from the day I was in that meeting to the day that I left. But the very first thing is to get clear on your why, what we already talked about. Why do you want it? Because you're going to need to come back to that again and again. But the next step is choosing a date. And that might seem so simple and so scary at the same time. Mm -hmm. But one thing I did is I looked ahead and I chose a date. 
and it was in June. And I, I wrote the exact date on a post-it note, put it on a mirror where I get ready in the morning. And I didn't just look at it every day. I looked at it and I said to myself, what's one thing, just one thing I can do today to get me closer to that date. And so it might be make a phone call. It might be read a book, listen to a podcast on my way to work, anything to fuel my mind or move me forward in actually quitting my job. And so that runway is so incredibly important. Another thing you wanna do during that time of making the decision and actually doing it is to get clear on your finances. And that does not mean to save a bunch of money. I had huge aspirations of saving like a year, year's worth of salary before I left. No way, that was not gonna happen. Yep. And so just getting clear on your finances and ask yourself, actually, how much money do I really need to make just to get by in my first year on my own? You're not gonna be taking vacations or putting in wood floors in your house or <laughs> living the lap of luxury. That's not what happens in the first few years of entrepreneurship. You're going to sacrifice for sure because you want it that bad. So how much money do you really need to make? And then we can start to think about, okay, well, how might we do that? And one of the things that I love that a lot of people do and what I did is start a side hustle while you're still in your nine to five job. A side hustle for me looked like I took a few clients and did their social media in the mornings and mm -hmm. the nights on weekends. So I had mm -hmm. a little money coming in and it wasn't enough to pay the bills, but it was enough to say, oh, this could actually work because that yeah. was like my first way of being a boss is I did social media for small businesses. What I do now looks dramatically different, but I needed to get started somewhere. So a side hustle could be a really great, just kind of put one foot out into entrepreneurship. I love that idea because it really takes away the immediate feeling of, of being threatened. Like if, if you're listening, yes. if you're watching and you're like, oh my God, I wanna do this, but I'm scared. What Amy just shared was that maybe your runway is like Amy's. Maybe you stay at this job for another year. But here's the thing. Create the runway that she walks you through. Get the book. Go to Amazon right now. Yeah. Two weeks notice. Amy Porterfield. <laughs> and do, do the runway. Like Make a plan. Put it in your calendar. Because it's okay if you have a year runway, a year and a half, whatever it needs to be for you. And I will agree with Amy, <laughs> you do not have to have all the money in the world saved. You just need to know exactly what right. you need to survive. I've made a ton of money before I quit entertainment and I had almost none when I, when I went to grad Same school. Girl. Same. Oh. And that's the greatest thing about uh, building an online business. There's very little overhead. Most people are gonna start with just as a solopreneur. You're not gonna hire someone out of the gate. You're not even gonna have a virtual assistant to start. So it's just you and you're doing business online, you're not paying for people or space or mm -hmm. a, a lot of the other things you would pay for in a regular type of business. Online businesses are dramatically different, which is why I focus on that in the book, because you can get started even if you don't have a bunch of money in the bank. Right, love, love, love. Um, all right, I have a question before I let you go. Personally, what has been your most challenging boundary struggle and how did you overcome it, if you have? Ooh. I have a lot, but one of the ones I really struggle with, and you know me personally, so I don't think you'll be surprised by this. You can help me put it into a boundary. I care deeply about what other people think of me, and I, I worry about that to the point that it's not healthy for me. I say all this knowing I absolutely work on it and gotten better at it because it's been a thing for many years, mm -hmm. but the boundary is like to the point that I have to stop caring about if she likes me, if he likes me, did I do this the right way in their eyes or whatever, and just look inward and say, how does it feel to you, Amy? Does that feel good? And if it feels good, end of story. Is that a boundary? Yes, that's actually yeah. an internal boundary. Okay. So where you're valuing what you think. So what you think, how you feel, what you want, you're able to prioritize those things. And that's really healthy to be able to do. And when we can't do that, what ends up happening is we end up really resentful of other people. Because yes. instead of it being about us not being able to honor our own boundaries, they're entitled, right? But yes. once you get your boundaries together, you're like, however they are, is their side of the street. This is my side of the street. Ooh, it's so good, Anne. I love it. So that's one thing that I'm working on, I'm very aware of. 
it's so important. It's so important to, to find your way. And you know, putting a book out in the world, it's very vulnerable. I was telling you, I feel naked in front of the whole world. I, I tell stories in there. I didn't necessarily want to tell, but mm -hmm. I think they're important to tell. And, and people are going to re review my book and rate it and all of that. And I want to stand in the fact that the words I wrote are worth reading. I know they will change lives. No matter if everyone loves it or not, I know the work I did will change lives. And yes. I want to stand in that. And so that's something that I've really been working on. That's so good. And, and I, you know, we were talking before we went live about being first time authors and yeah. my, my own experience was similar to yours because we're, we're like the ultimate givers, you know, and, and so to have to then turn around and ask other people to support the book, oh, it's so painful, right? We didn't even talk about that, but that's so funny you brought that up. That's been one of the hardest things. I don't like asking for favors left and right. No one told me that's part of uh, putting a book out into the world. And so, and you know, the way I get around that is I think I have supported many, many people's books launches on my own podcast and in my own way. And so I remember that I was a giver just like you. You've done that immensely. You're doing it right now. And mm -hmm. so I have to remind yeah. myself, but the favor thing, woo! If you want to grow personally, write a book and put it out in the world. Because <laughs> there's no way you won't. Oh my God. I got the greatest advice though around my resistance to ask people to support my oh, book back in the day. You so, tell. Do yeah. tell. So I had hired a consultant named Camper Bull, who is amazing, and I love him very much, and he helped a lot. So, but one thing, because this was becoming a, a thing, this was a problem with, I know so many high profile people in my life, in, in my world, in my past life, who wanted to support the book, right? Yeah. And the idea of asking anyone to do anything made me want to throw up. I was like, I don't get it. And I, I was looking at it the way you were, like, I don't want to owe anyone anything kind of, or I don't want to ask for favors. Like I find mm -hmm. doing them, but it's hard to ask. And Camper was like, Terry, do you think you wrote a good book? And I was like, yes. He was like, did you write the book you wanted to write? Yes. Do you think your book is going to help people in the world? And I said, without a doubt. Mm -hmm. And he was like, you're not asking them to do anything for you. You're giving them an opportunity to be a part of this revolution of healing and helping and lessening suffering. Like mm. you're doing it for the book. And I was like, yes. that's doing it for okay, you. That is so helpful because yeah, that I wrote this book because I know I could help especially women, but men and women break out of what's no longer serving them and step into a life that they actually design on their own. Like I very much believe that. So if I lead with that, where I'm giving them a gift that you get to give this to other people, that is a beautiful way of looking at it. I needed that. Thank you, my friend. You always come through. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You really do. The, the book is two weeks notice. You really do if you're even remotely somewhere in the back of your mind, if this is speaking to you at all, you want to go and get this book. The full name, Two Weeks Notice, Find the Courage to Quit Your Job, Make More Money, Work Where You Want, and Change the World by my friend, Amy Porterfield. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Amy. I love you and I appreciate you. And I've already pre-ordered my book already. I'm so incredibly oh. excited for you. Thank you, friend. I love you so much. Thanks for having me. You're welcome.